again the second district. Take your ear. Can't hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to introduce the, the candidates now. The first candidate is Charlie Dirador. Charlie, if you would come up, please. Charlie is 48 years old. He is a real estate developer and investor. He has uh, his own company, Lions Core Development Company. Charlie has a BA from VCU in political science. He is on the uh, board of the Virginia Center for Inclusive, Inclusive Communities. He was a vestryman of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, and he is currently the vice president of the Fan District Association. The second candidate is Charles Samuels. Charles, if you would come up, please. Charles is 36 years old. He is an attorney and he represents indigent and at-risk youth. Charles has a Bachelor of Arts from the College of William and Mary and a JD from the University of Richmond. He is the incumbent councilman. He is a former president of the Fan District Association. He's on the board of the Maymont Foundation in his capacity as being on city council. He serves on the Bird Theatre Foundation Advisory Board and he does perform pro bono legal representation for domestic violence victims. Ryan, they're both yours. All right. uh, before we get started, I, and I, this was mentioned before, but let me reiterate it. Uh, we're good, we've been taping everything tonight. And, and hand for uh, my photographer here, Jamie Wright. Who's, uh, Our goal is that, uh, it probably not going to happen tonight, but hopefully over the next couple of days we'll have the entire debates, both uh, from the 2nd and the 5th District, uh, on our website in some capacity, uh, so that uh, for folks that couldn't be here tonight, you can let them know about it, uh, and we can spread the word, because we've had a very substantive discussion up until this point. I want to also thank you for how well you behaved in the first debate. At one point I thought that I was uh, at Mass at St. Benedict's down the road where I go to church, because uh, you were all so well behaved. So uh, let's uh, continue to do that so that we can keep uh, the focus on the issues today. Uh, so we have two terrific candidates here with us tonight. And I believe you said Charlie gets the closing statement, correct? Right. So the one thing for sure, no matter what, somebody who could go by the nickname of Chuck is going to win this race. <laughs> that wasn't a very good joke, wasn't it? I was working on that all day. I was going to say somebody named Charlie or someone with the given name Charles, but since you both distinctly go by one of those names, I didn't Usually you should just let a bad joke go, right? <laughs> and I have not. Right away. All right, okay. So Charles, I'm going to start with you on this first question. And um, it was touched on a little bit in our first debate, but I'd like to get into it a little bit more in-depthly. And the, the city auditor, uh, Umesh Dalal, has said that there's roughly $75 million being wasted in Richmond city government, which I think probably most people just find appalling. Uh, so the question is, uh, since we've been able to identify where this money is being wasted, how can we stop this? Specifically. They should be appalled if it were true. And here's the deal. The National Association of Government Auditors has said that 5% of any locality's budget, state, national, local, whatever, can be spent better. That's where the 75 number came from in this campaign. Everybody throughout all the districts is using it, especially opponents of incumbents, because it's a big number and you can spend a lot of money if you're better with your spending. But it's a guess. There's no facts to base in reality that in the city. There is a lot of money in the auditor's reports that we can save. And each year I've put mandates into the budget, they're called text amendments, to ensure that the administration spends the money to incorporate more and more each year of the auditor's recommendations. In the last two years, the auditor has found $3.1 million that could be spent better. 
3.1 is a lot different than 75 million. We've already implemented those mandates on over half of those, and we're working to implement mandates on the rest. Sometimes it takes longer if you have to go through a procurement process to purchase a specific software. A good example is the police. They had to get some new surveillance systems in order to follow the auditor's uh, recommendations. It takes time to go through the procurement process to get those uh, surveillance cameras installed. It's not an actual number. It's a guess based on a national suggestion. So I, I wanted to sway people of that idea right off the bat. Uh, well, let me get Charlie in on that. Do you, do you agree? Do you think that that's not a made up guess number? at all. In fact, uh, Umesh's reports are online, and you can read them, and, and the money's there. Uh, the, the problem is we've got a city council that doesn't have the will to implement those reports or tell the mayor to implement those reports. Uh, six years ago, uh, one of the auditor's reports was about uh, the fleet maintenance uh, system. Uh, Six million dollars in that report, five million dollars in that report, and uh, that hasn't been uh, adjudicated as of yet. Uh, why? Why are we still sitting here with all these auditors' reports on the table? And I disagree with you; they're real. Uh, they're online for you to read. Why are we still talking about them and not doing something about them? Do you think that number is that big, though? Oh yes, seventy-five million. I sat down with Uvesh Law. I mean, it's, it's an amazing. It's staggering the waste, fraud, and abuse in this system. Right. I, I sat down with Umesh and said, where did the $75 million come from? Charlie Spall meant that he sat down with him. Umesh says, no. Charlie came to a press conference. It's actually on his blog. Charlie came to a press conference where Umesh used that number as the example. I sat down with Umesh and he said, no, that's not the correct number. Here's a real number, a factual based number, fact-based number I can show you about how much money the city can save. There's a difference between listening and jumping to Okay, so Charlie, even if you do think that that number is 75 million, I mean, uh, Charles has kind of outlined some of the hurdles that come into place in terms of the bureaucratic process of government. Give me something specific that you would do as a city councilman that perhaps Charles isn't doing that would allow this, the uh, city government to be spending that money more effectively. Specific. Spending more money or saving money? Either. <laughs> Not wasting it, I guess is what I'm asking. All right, well, first of all, uh, if we were able to implement those audits, which we have not been able to do as of yet, uh, they do it incrementally, they don't do it wholesale, which I would advocate for. Uh, one of the first things I would do uh, is, is look at how we can uh, pay our firefighters and our teachers and our police officers in a better manner, in a more respectful manner. They haven't gotten a pay raise in five years. Um, and in the last uh, year, we, we've lost 24 police officers in this city, uh, not to retirement, but they've left. But well, what does that have to do with saving the money in the... Well, you're asking audience. how we're going to spend the money. Right. No, 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 I'm asking how are you going to prevent $75 million from being wasted? Implement the audits. Talk to the mayor. Communicate with the mayor. And, and, and at one point or another, this council, this six, has got to stop being a rubber stamp for Mayor Dwight Jones. And that's what I see happening over and over again, Ryan. So, Charles, are you a rubber stamp for Mayor Jones? How would you... How would you uh, defend that accusation? When we, as a city, voted to change our form of government, we got rid of the city manager system, we put an elected mayor in, city council became a legislative body. We're not nine little mayors anymore. In order to implement an auditor's recommendation, which we have been doing, and I've been doing specifically, you have to put something called a text amendment, a mandate to the administration that says, this is how you will spend X amount of money, and this is where that money is going to be allocated from, this is how it's going to be spent, and these are the benchmarks that have to be reached. We've done that. I've done that specifically each year I've been on council. The mayor, technically speaking, the chief administrative officer of the city, the administration, actually has to implement it. I think my opponent might still be living in the past. We're not nine little mayors that can boss the city manager around and he's got to worry about how to keep five people on his side so he can keep his job. Byron Marshall doesn't answer to any of us, he answers to the mayor. The mayor's the only person that can fire him. Our authority, our power as a council, as council members and as the body, is specifically through legislation. 
It's not through bossing people around. In order to make it work, you have to work with the people to build consensus, and you have to work with the administration to make sure we're all on the same page. City divided against itself is not going to stand. That's why I think it's so important to use outcome-based budgeting. Work with the citizens to find out what they want addressed, and then budget towards those goals. Okay, we're not going to let this dominate everything, so we're going to move on to another topic. Uh, and, and this is a topic that I think is especially applicable here in the fan, and that is the noise ordinance, which is something we've covered quite a bit on television. Uh, and one of the big complaints that uh, city residents seem to have is that there is kind of a, a uh, ineffective and sometimes inequitable way that this noise ordinance is implemented. Charlie, do you think that the current noise ordinance works? And if not, how would you change it? I, I don't think that it works. Um, the noise ordinance has been a, a, a political topic for Charles all along. In fact, when I looked at your uh, uh, campaign finance reports, I saw where you bought the noise meter that you have with campaign finance funds instead of out of your own pocket. So it's automatically a political issue. Uh, here's the you point. can do that, though. That's part of his. I, 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 you can I, I, use I campaign know. funds as part of your responsibility. Here's the point. Council here's person. the point. We chose to live in an urban area. We chose to live in an urban area. And 55 decibels is really not realistic. Um, you know, Charles is from Gushan, and I grew up here. I knew what I was getting into when I moved here. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, it's on till the light of dawn, but what I am saying is that 65 decibels, 70 decibels would be a more realistic number. Now, we could bring it up in zones, where if you lived in Windsor Farms, or if you lived in Lock Green, or if you lived in any of these other quieter areas, then you could have a lower threshold. But I think if you live in an urban, dense zone, that you should be expected to understand that you live in an urban, dense zone, we live next to each other, and there's going to be noise that you're gonna to have to deal with. I agree, we need a noise ordinance. The first one he wrote, unconstitutional. Judge threw it out. First, the second one he wrote, has been called ill-written by the mayor of the city. So, you know, I think it needs reworking. And when I get there, I will undertake a uh, process with you all uh, to rework it. Charles, is 55 decibels reasonable? Is it? Uh... Depends on who you ask. So, let's put it into context. My voice in this room, I would guess, is somewhere between 55 and 65. That's the noise that you all are hearing. That's okay. You're here so we can have this dialogue. You probably don't mind hearing me. But at 3 a.m. in your bed, do you want to hear me? I'm not even sure my wife wants to hear me. It's not where the sound is coming from. It's from where the source, it's, excuse me, it's from where it is offended. So to just suggest a number isn't really given the full story. 55 decibels in your house at 2 a.m. is very different than what is allowed during the daytime. But get into the specifics a little bit of, uh, of it, and I think the big problem that folks have had is that, A, which you both have already touched on, it's difficult to ascertain what's offensive. And secondly, how do you enforce it? Does it mean people have got to call police and tattle on their neighbors? Does it mean police officers wandering around neighborhoods with decibel meters in their hands? What's the most effective way, if you do set some standard, for that standard to be enforced? The most effective way for the standard to be enforced is for people to be good neighbors and understand we live in a community. I have no interest in moving out of the family. My wife has no interest in moving out of the family. But I hear young families all the time tell me, I can't stand this noise anymore. I know I chose to live in an urban setting, but I'm gonna have to move out to the suburbs just to get a night's sleep. I live too close to VCU. Maybe that is where we're headed. Maybe the fan is meant to be for uh, empty nesters and for college kids and all the families go somewhere else. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. But when it comes to actually measuring the noise, the state set out the guidelines for how it's done. We obey the state's guidelines. We don't have a choice in that. When it comes to the actual measurements, it's delineated in the law how far away from a wall that's in a multifamily unit it has to be, the measuring unit has to be. And if it's on private property in a single family residence, it's also delineated where the measurements come from. Now, 
And the police are not coming around, just driving around looking for noise out of their car. First of all, it wouldn't work. Cars are exempt and the car would overwhelm anything else because it's the closest noise source. Secondly, sorry, but we've got other issues in the city. Now it's true, from the time I started council till now, crime in the city has dropped 20%. But that doesn't mean anything when you're the one who's being woken up at 3 a.m. by somebody blasting their sharing. Okay, let's move on, and, and you kind of already touched on this topic, and that's the topic of safety, which is a, a very important topic in light of the last couple of days. We've seen a, a really big spike in crime in and around VCU uh, in the past couple of days, and, it, and it, it appears to be coming kind of the, the tipping point of what we've seen growing over the past year. What can we do? to reduce the amount of crime. And, and this perception, I'm a, I teach at VCU, so I, I talk to students every day. The perception is I'm okay when I'm on campus or in a campus building, but if I step off even a few feet, I've gotta be worried. I've gotta have somebody with me. I shouldn't be out at night. That's a serious issue, isn't it? And, and what can we do to solve that problem? Yes, Charles. I do criminal defense work, and I hear stories from all sides of the issue. But I'll tell you one thing specific. Nobody goes out planning to be a victim. It's incredibly important that we take care of where we're going and how we're going. Sometimes crime does happen though, and that's where we need the police on the streets. We're never going to be able to eradicate all forms of crime. I, I wish we could, I wish we could live in utopia, it's not going to be the case. We have a spike in crime right now, and I've been in touch regularly with the police to make sure we're doing everything we can, and they have the resources they need to combat this spike. But when you look at where the crimes are occurring, and you look at the descriptions, you start to see certain things that are coming out of those. Remember the uh, bandit, bandana bandits from a few years ago? Crime spree like no other. Or well, not like no so I mean, just, uh, do you think it's an isolated problem, or do you think there's a systematic problem that needs to be addressed? Is it just a, a period in time that we're going through, or? Historically, there have been spikes in crime. When you get a few people off the street, those crimes disappear. A good example, a few years ago when I was on council, uh, Lieutenant Capriglian and I were at a meeting, and he told me, uh, look, we arrested this guy. It was for trespassing. We ended up finding some drugs on him. We haven't been able to clear any of these robberies, but ever since this guy got picked up, the robberies have stopped. And I don't know if he ever got pinned with any of those robberies or not, but the fact is you get that person off the street and that spike disappears. So Charlie, Charlie, do you think there's something specific as a council member you could do to help what appears to be at this problem, at this point a problem in the sure. Uh, sure, we, we've, got, we've got a major problem uh, with the relationship between the rank and file police officers and, and the brass in this town. They get along, but they don't feel respected. Um, Charles, you, you wrote in your op-ed piece that you had fully funded police. You had fully funded police. Uh, let me ask you, if you don't mind. Well, does fully, well then I'll pose the question generally. Does fully funding police mean taking their STEP program away from them? Taking their career development program away from them? And taking any hope that they might have of a pay raise until 2016, 2018, away from them. If you don't have a good esprit de corps, if you do not have a police force that feels secure in their job, I talk to street cops all the time. Uh, Richmond Coalition Police endorsed me. If you don't respect them with a modicum of a pay raise, I, I've talked to people that said, well, I didn't get a pay raise for the past five years either. But give them something. Something to hold on to. They're going to, I mean, they're leaving. 24 of them left last year. I think that if you have a healthy police force that's able to present a presence out into the neighborhoods, you can at least dissuade some of the crime. Now, let me say something. These crimes that have happened in the past two weeks have been random, they have been awful, and I don't blame the police for it at all. But what I am saying is if we had more police presence throughout the communities, including that VCU area, that VCU corridor, we could 
maybe dissuaded some of these criminals from doing some of these things. Charles, let me have you respond first to uh, Charlie's point about your role in the crafting of the police budget, but also to the point that if the police were funded a little bit better, that these crimes maybe wouldn't be as big an issue. My uncle was a Chesterfield County police officer for many years until he was injured on the job. To suggest for one second that the police are not doing their job because they don't have good morale. No, 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 the police chief comes to us to explain what he is proposing for his budget. He says, this is the money I need to do my job, and this is delineating out how we plan on spending it. The council approved every single penny of it. We asked him if he needed more. He said no. Go ahead. Charles, the top brass, the chief and the deputy, the, chief, the deputy chiefs, all got it pay raises, 5% pay raises, and yet the rank and file police officers didn't get a pay raise. That's unfair. But whose fault is that? Is that the chief or the city council? I mean, if, I'm the city council if I'm the city council and I'm on the public safety committee, I'm going to say, y'all got to go back and rework work that. I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. Because that was in the budget, was it not? Did you not see that in the budget? All right, let's move on. Um... Uh, we, let's uh, move on to something completely different, and that's, uh, we talked about this in the, in the first exchange, let's talk about it again, and that's the Redskins, which obviously impacts your district uh, heavily as well. Um, and there's a different in the 5th District debate where there's a space uh, in City Stadium that uh, seems like a uh, logical space, there needs to be something done there, um, where so they are, are welcoming it with open arms. The space that's being talked about uh, behind the DMV, which from my understanding of the, of the story seems to be the leader in the clubhouse, so to speak, uh, is something that would be a complete difference in terms of what we see there now. We get rid of quite a bit of uh, uh, green space um, that there is becoming less and less of in the city. It would require a pretty significant construction project. Charlie, do you think that that's where it goes? And if you do think that's where it should go, would you adv advocate, for it, advocate for it as a city council? I don't think that's where it goes. I think it goes to city stadium. Um, you've got a football field there now, you put a second football field there and you do investments around the area. You get Dan Snyder, who's got plenty of money, to put up money to put uh, his uh, offices there for the coaches uh, and uh, film facilities there. Uh, and in turn, that is only three weeks, if those of you who were here earlier noted. Uh, and Ryan, in fact, uh, we do have high school football players who don't have places to play at Friday Night Lights. Uh, if the Redskins are out of here by early August or mid-August, then of course we could uh, have high school football there on Friday evenings. But you don't think the DMV is the location? I don't. I think it's a great green space and I also think that at one point or another we can tie green space into a development around that area to include the boulevard. And the boulevard has got to be that connector between the fan and north side. All right. Charles, is that your take on it? No. Uh in order to do the city stadium project, you have to tear down half the city stadium. The Redskins are requiring two fields side by side, two full football fields side by side. It's not enough room in city stadium as it is. Plus, you have to have what I call the push field, which is where they run into the sleds with the cushions on them. And you can tell I didn't play football with soccer, right? Uh, you're going to need a club out in my clubhouse. You're going to need a field house, and you're going to need additional office space. It's not the best location. Realistically, no decision has been made on this, certainly not by council who gets final say. To my knowledge, no decision was made on this by the administration, and I had a conversation about this with the mayor yesterday. However, when you look at that space, there's a very wooded area, and there's not a wooded area. If we can put those fields, and it fits, on the not wooded area with more than a one-to-one -one tree replacement for the few trees that will be taken down, complete a new Vita course in the wooded area, the addition of the field house plus the office space, and perhaps a, another partner that would have some sort of additional building there, uh, with the Science Museum right there, we're certain 
there's some draw for either medicine or science in that area, either through VCU, another health advocate here in town. We have an opportunity for an economic bolster, now it's only three weeks a year, in the second district to help our businesses and to encourage our residents. In addition to that, I believe the stadium, the baseball stadium, ought to stay in or almost exactly where it is. This is becoming an opportunity for the boulevard to grow into a sports area, a retail area, something that is known far and wide to bring people in. And we're not there yet. We still got to build consensus in the community. And if the consensus in the community is no, we don't want it here, then I am happy, happy to accept that. But I'm not going to turn something down that has the opportunity to build up our area uh, just because. Uh, the baseball stadium was going to be my next question. So, uh, Charles, just to, uh, you've already kind of made your point on that. But to specifically ask you, does the baseball stadium get torn down and a new one built? And if so, should taxpayer dollars be part of that project? I would prefer taxpayer dollars not be part of that project. I've looked at a bunch of studies. The majority of them suggest taxpayer dollars uh, are not best spent in stadiums. However, I would like to see the baseball stadium stay where it is, or at least within that general area of north of the railroad track, south of 6495. I think we have an opportunity here to work with local as well as national businesses to find a way to make it work. There's a million proposals out there about how to do it, but we have bigger fish to fry in the city than just the stadium. I want to see a stadium built. I have no intention of losing the squirrels, but we got some core service issues that we also need to address. All right, well, Charlie, uh, I want your take first. Is the boulevard the place for the ballpark, or should it go to Shaco Bottom? But I, I, I always kind of chuckle. You don't know me, do you? <laughs> well, I do know you. But I always kind of chuckle when I hear this debate about baseball, and you've obviously been very, uh, very uh, connected to it, because everybody always talks about, well, what's it going to take to build a baseball stadium? And then I always think to myself, $25 million, right? I mean, where's $25 million coming from? And should it come from uh, city taxpayer dollars or regional taxpayer dollars? First of all, it's not 25 million, and it's not 50 million like's been like has been bantered about in the press either. Uh, Sugarland, Texas, just built a baseball stadium. Sugarland, Texas, an outlier to Houston, 38 and a half million dollars, and they use the same team that I brought to Richmond, Opening Day Partners, to build their stadium. These guys are really good at what they do. Let me address your question. Taxpayer dollars. It is not time to build a baseball stadium at the beginning of the season. The mayor and Mr. DeBella stood in, on the first baseline and said, Mr. DeBella said, we are the Richmond Flying Squirrels. And everybody applauded. And then at the end of the season, um, Jack Berry and Mr. Schuler uh, put out an op-ed piece and said, it's going to the bottom. We gotta stop talking about it. We have to understand that Henrico's ready to play, Chesterfield's ready to play, Hanover's ready to play, but at the right economic time. In 2009, I told everyone that a $77 million bond issuance for a baseball stadium in Shaco Bottom would not fly as a non-recourse bond. This government issued a $150,000 study through Davenport to say a $77 million bond issuance wouldn't work without taxpayer, uh, taxpayer expenses. How do we do it? I think we do it private public. Uh, the, the squirrels have already said they would uh, put up a quarter of the money. I think we'd find some corporate partners to shoulder some of the burden, and I think a unique opportunity here sits for folks to put up money uh, out of their own pocket and to have ownership of that state, not taxpayer dollars, but do so we like, like, like a Packers, like yeah, a Packers approach. buying shares of it? Sure. And what's the final price tag, though? So it's not $25 million it's not. I've talked to Carney about this. I've talked to Lou DeBella about this. I think about 38 and a half to 40 million dollars gets the stadium done. That but that builds an 8,500 seat stadium, and it builds everything infrastructure wise that we need. Now we do it where they work on the on the. Uh, in my opinion, we do it where they work on the on the on the uh, police cars and the uh, fire trucks. Right where the auditor said there was $5 million in waste fraud and abuse. You get rid of that, you, you, you outsource all of that work, remediate that site, put the baseball stadium there, and then you tie that all to mixed use. You know, people living, people working, people so playing. You're saying the time is not now, when is the time? 
and how long when the economy costs. gets better. So what are the, I mean, the schools are basically threatened that they're they're ready to leave in the near future if, the, if things don't go their way. They haven't threatened. I know Lou DeBella. Well, patient I mean, enough. you may know Lou DeBella, but uh, Charlie, yeah, let's be honest, you know, he goes into the media on a pretty regular basis right. and says there's all these other cities courting us, and if we don't get our stadium, we're going to leave. That's Joe McGathrin. That's Joe McGrath uh, McGathrin, sorry. It's still Dude. threatening. I mean, that's the feeling the average person gets. Well, I mean, I understand you might be on the inside of this, but... Minor league when does all is not an economic driver. Right. They're not leaving. They're making plenty of money. They leave almost every night with their pockets full of money. They're not leaving. They know a good thing when they see one. I think they have the patience to wait for the economy to get better. Three or four years from now, we'll be able to pull this deal off. Okay, all right, let's move on. Let's talk about parking, which is something you two often like to talk about. And um, did, okay, Charles, I asked you the, well, I'm gonna start with Charles because the baseball conversation uh, went a little bit more to Charlie's way. Uh, you guys obviously had a very public, uh, I don't know if spat is the right word, but you had a differing opinion about the situation with overnight parking and parking in areas around bars uh, in the fan. And I mean, I think we do a lot of stories about people complaining about parking in the fan, not only from residents, but business owners. Uh, Charles, what's the happy medium that we can come to that would allow fan residents the opportunity to find reasonable parking spaces close to where they live, but then also allow people like me that live out in the suburbs to come in and enjoy a bite to eat without having to drive around the block 25 times. That's a constant struggle. And if you ask different parking experts, they'll give you different parking answers. On West Broad Street, I propose that everybody come together, sort out what really everyone could agree to, and then we would implement that change. My opponent said we need to change the times to 2.30 a.m. to 4 or 6 a.m. Then he changed his mind and said, I'm going to immediately take down the signs if I was the councilman. It's illegal to do that, but that's what he said. Then he finally said, well, all right, Charles's way would, is the right way, but I would have done it faster. The normal process for taking down parking signs is approximately 90 days. I got it done in 45. By using the information available to me, where did that information come from? By being willing to take the time to sit down with people and talk about what they really wanted, and by willing, being willing to sit down and read the city code, read the state laws, understand what we are allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do, instead of just guessing or shooting from the head. In the rest of the fan, West Gray Street last week, we opened up 20 guaranteed spaces and eliminated four, at least four uh, loading zones, opening up another 10, 15, 20 spaces. A couple of years ago, I convened a group of people, including restaurant owners, business owners, public works, public utilities, the mayor's office. We literally walked what was going to become the arts district, and in one afternoon opened up 86 new parking spaces downtown in the second district, so people had better opportunities for parking. The fan is exactly the same. There are some laws that are incredibly frustrating. City and state laws forbid us from parking between 20 and 30 feet from a curb or an intersection or a, uh, a handicap ramp. And that eliminates, if it's fully enforced by the police, that would eliminate 16 parking spaces per intersection. Multiply the number of intersections in the fan, and it's thousands of parking spaces we lose. And we gotta be safe though, so we have this careful thing where we try not to do it and we hope the police don't ticket us but the bottom line is it is the law we have to find another solution and that's what we've been working for years on the fan parking fan parking started i believe in the mid 70s and since that time it's been tweaked and prodded into its current situation and even now on monday night there was an update at the west avenue association saying what the next steps were for their street because as part of zone one they're looking for additional changes to the parking center the answer is simple work with the neighbors work within the law and make sure that when you do it you do it right and you don't have to go back and change what you said and charlie let me uh, pose this question to you and kind of in light of what charles is alluding to about your style uh, and he said made this point a couple of times that perhaps your temperament as a city councilman might not play that well, that you're 
your idea would be to just kind of go in there and tell people what you think and maybe not be willing to sit down and talk to folks. Is this issue of parking one that perhaps diplomacy is a better route, or do you think somebody needs to come in and shake things up? Let me ask you a question. If you've got 90% agreement between the residents and the business owners on Broad Street, what diplomacy is needed? You still have right. to follow the law. You write. Well, I'm not a lawyer, Charles. I'm a businessman. You write the you write the legislation, and you get the signs taken down. His characterization of me is that I'm going to be out there with uh, pliers and a, and a ladder. Uh, that's not what I said. I'm mischaracterizing what I said. What I said was write the paper and do the people's will. And if you depend on the mayor's office. It's going to get dragged out. You were in the meeting, I believe, on Broad Street, where a police officer showed up. A brass plate showed up. A gold shield, I should say, showed up. And said, I'm here for a meeting. And we all said, great, a police officer showed up for a parking meeting. Um, no, I didn't come here for the parking meeting. I came here to be on radio. Oh, well, the radio station's WRIR, and it's upstairs. Okay. Then all of a sudden, somebody from the mayor's office shows up and says, uh, is this the parking thing? Oh, okay. Well, we've decided to let it go ahead and get done. The signs will be down next week. Is that how it works? Or do we have a city council person who listens to both sides of the issue, sees that there's massive agreement, and does something about it? All right, we'll let you make one last point on this, and then we've got to move on. There was massive agreement between the businesses and the residents. There was not massive agreement between the police, the administration, the businesses, the residents. You gotta bring everybody to the table because it's not any one person's option. We're all in this together. Now, Charlie's gonna put in a paper to have him removed. The first thing that happens with that paper is the pause button gets hit for 60 days by law while the administration looks at it, decides how they feel about it, and only then can it be released to a subcommittee of council. Right. But let's not get into the minutiae right. counts. So, but you know, is, you're the point is, 90-day process his way, I got it done. But so, I mean, he, can I say one? I know you said you can't wait for the mayor's office, but you have to have the mayor to have something like this done, right? This is the problem with Richmond City government. It's broken. We implemented this new form of government in 05, and what have we gotten for it? We've gotten studies. We've gotten, well, it has to go here, and then it has to go there. And then it has to go over here. And when you say bring everybody to the table, Charles, these are the people that need to be at the table, not the police, not the mayor. If it's their will to get something done, and I'm a populist in nature, Ryan. I mean, that's my nature. Let's get it done. So Let's are, you, are you advocating for getting rid of the strong mayor form of government? Because that would require no, I'm solution. certainly not, but I am, for, I am for getting rid of the wasting of time, the wasting of money. The, the time it takes to get a piece of legislation through, I mean, those people on West Gray Street said, this will alleviate parking uh, pressures on our street. It'd be great. The businesses said, we want it. Okay, why can't it happen in 60 days? Because the law won't allow it. Okay, we're not gonna, that's, that's, yeah, the law needs to change. Okay, uh, so. Let's uh, now, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, and that'll give us a little bit of time for closing statements, but I also want the opportunity for each of you to ask each other a question. So, uh, Charles, you can ask Charlie the first question. Anytime. Charlie. <laughs> My opponent's telling everybody in the city is broken. The city's in crisis. Charlie, in the past five years, we've seen a million dollars in new development. We've seen the UCI, the Redskins, the Flying Squirrels stay. 82% of city citizens say the city's on the right track. Outdoor Magazine rated us the best town ever. And last year alone, 1,300 new people moved into the city because they wanted to. That's not broken, is it? Charles, <laughs> listen to you. Uh, if I've got business people in, in Hanover County that I know that want to move a business here but won't do it in, in Scott's edition because they're worried about the streets being broken and their trucks taking a beating, uh, that's a problem. If I've got uh, uh, 
middle class, upper middle class families when I go door to door saying, um, Charlie, after fifth grade, yeah, Fox is great, Holden is great, but I gotta go, I gotta go to the counties. Uh, that's broken. Uh, it's funny, you and I just look at the world a little differently. I see a city that I understand because I've lived here all of my life and I still don't understand why they cut the side of our streets up, sleeve the gas lines, sleeve the water lines, and didn't think to, cave, to pave our streets back. They just patched them back and said, that's good enough. That's broken. Sidewalks, broken. A uh, water bill, before you even flush a toilet or you uh, turn on a sink, $50. That's broken. We need a council that will start to focus on real, everyday problems of the people of this city. All right, uh, Charlie, your opportunity to ask Charles a question now. Now you have to give me a minute. Well, let's have in 2009, I called you three or four times. I supported you for election to city council. And I said, I left message upon message upon message and asked you, please, Charles, engage in this baseball debate. Where are you? And at one point, I talked to Jan, because Jan and I have been around bill paneling a lot. And I said, Jan, where is he? Why won't he jump in? This is a big deal. I wanted to help you. Why didn't you engage in 2009? There's two ways to go. I watched Bill Panley when I was a paralegal at McCandlish Holden, or McCandlish, Missoula McCandlish back then. I watched Tim Kane be a city council person, a family man, and win one of the largest jury verdicts in Virginia history. I hope to be half the man he was. Charlie, I also watched you spend three, four, five hours of the day in Bill's office talking. And at some point, you realize that there's other people out there that know things that you can get accomplished without spending your whole day trying to get it done. That's why I didn't engage you, because I didn't want to waste an entire day when I could get the same results through somebody just as smart and with better points of contact in the industry to do the job. I apologize. The point is, you're a constituent, and I did meet with you, but I'm not gonna waste an entire day for one guy when it's somebody who has your reputation. Okay, uh, if you feel there's a need to respond to either of that, um, each will get a two-minute closing statement, and uh, Charlie, you have the opportunity to give the final closing statement. I Oh, you have a second, I'm sorry. Charles. I think I had to remember, Bill, I'm sorry. Four years ago, I came to you guys and asked for your support in my run for city council. And I promised to focus on three areas. Improve our quality of life, revitalize our neighborhoods, and demand accountability from government. I've asked for four audits while I've been on uh, council. And we've already started making implementations on each of those audits. For the first time in its history, the fan lighting project is funded for multiple years. It's never happened before now, but it's happened now. There's money not just for Grace, for uh, North, South, or Mulberry. There's also money in it for Ford. We're going to keep that project going. You get these results by knowing how to work with people, by building consensus in the community, by building consensus on council, and by building consensus in the administration to move everybody forward together. We've put a, cons a conservation easement on the James River Park system. That keeps those parks safe for not just me, not just Henry, but Henry's kids, our grandchildren, their grandchildren. I've got $2 million in a budget to help restore <coughs> the Grove Park and Adam Clay Park, a park that other people will be happy to transfer to another entity. The point is this, when you're looking to enhance your quality of life, when you're looking to revitalize neighborhoods, that's what I've done. 
I realized that the tax abatement program for rehabbing our houses in the famine and other areas was about to expire. That program was going to go away. I removed the sunset provision on it to make sure that that program will keep on going. We're starting to see those abatements come offline now. Where we're starting to see 100% taxes again on those entities. That was the point of that program, to rebuild it, to rebuild our city, to rebuild our neighborhoods. It's working, and we've got it in place to continue to work. But we have to address some issues in the city. We have to address poverty. We have to address education. Education is not just a stump speech for me. At 25 grand a year as a city council person, you do not send your children to private, private schools. This is Henry's soon-to-be school. Benford is the next place he'll go. And we'll see where he's going after that, depending on how he does in school. But the point is, I'm in this with you. I build by consensus. I lead by consensus. And I need your help on November 6th. Thank you guys very much. Okay. Brian, thank you for coming here. And uh, I want to thank the Fan District Association, my fellow board members, for hosting this. I want to thank you all for coming here as well. I know that it shows that you share a deep abiding interest in our neighborhood. And I share that with you. I understand this neighborhood. I grew up in this neighborhood with my father building restaurants and running restaurants and, and uh, watching them as I was a little kid. I understand this neighborhood because I worked at Stewart Circle Pharmacy. And I learned there that this is a, a unique community we live in. And it's a unique community that deserves unique representation. You know, as I went door to door, and I announced in February, I'm, a, I'm, I'm glutton for punishment, I announced early. As I announced and went door to door, I heard one theme over and over. Charlie, if we don't do something about the middle schools in this city, then we're going to have a problem. I've got to leave. I will work diligently with our school board representative, if you've heard the first debate, to go line by line to make sure that the funding is there to bring an IB school north of the James River. That's got to happen to keep families in the fan. Secondly, we have got to fix the streets and the sidewalks in this city generally, but in this district specifically. We are the fan district, folks. It is not right that there's a speed bump at the 1200 block of Park Avenue where there's a, a, a gash in the street. What are we going to do? Pull up the Belgian blocks and repave the street after we've repaved the street, after we've repaved the street, after we've cut the street up? I want to be your pair of eyes. I want to be that person that's out there looking out for you every day on the street, working. I need your help on November the 6th. I have appreciated being a part of the Fan District Association. Those park cleanups, there's one next weekend, mean the world to me. That's it. On November the 6th, you've got a stark choice here. There's his way and my way. And we respect each other. But I will tell you, I'm right. You need an advocate. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. We'll have a little bit of this tonight on NBC 12 News at 11. And as I said, we'll get uh, it posted up on uh, probably on my blog, Decision Virginia, within the next couple of days. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight.